Welcome to Physics 2. In Physics 1, we were able to describe nearly everything in terms of length, mass, and time, so our three fundamental units were the meter, the kilogram, and the second. To get into Physics 2, to study electric phenomena, magnetic phenomena, and light, we need one more fundamental unit, the unit of electric charge, which in the metric system is the Coulomb. What is charge? You're going to know a lot of these basics already, depending on what you've had in other science classes, chemistry, and so forth. So I'm just going to run through this in summary. Everything is made out of charges. All ordinary matter is made out of three kinds of particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons are positive, the electrons are negative. Neutrons don't have a charge. Now chemistry is interesting because there are two competing uh, motions towards stability. You can be stable by canceling out your electric charge, or you can be stable by being symmetric. Noble gases like helium atoms and argon atoms, uh, there's no conflict. They're just stable all by themselves. But in all other elements that aren't noble gases, there's a conflict. In order to become stable with symmetry, you tend to pick up an electric charge. And in order to be electrically neutral, you end up a little unstable, unsymmetric. The reaction to that in chemistry is to form molecules, or ionic solids, or what we call network solids, which can be either something like diamond or something like metal. We need to talk about matter and what it's made out of. We didn't really have to do this for gravity because gravity just pulls on everything the same. If it's got mass, it pulls on. Electric charge, it's different. But because every material is made out of equal and opposite amounts of positive and negative charge, and every single one of those charges is going to be reacting to the environment. But we have to talk about the overall effects on different kinds of matter. Now, different materials will react differently when exposed to electric charge, or what we call an electric field. More on that in a bit. What do these things do? Uh, charges come in plus and minus, and you've probably heard that opposites attract, and like charges repel. So if you have a plus and a plus, they will try to push apart. A negative and a negative, they will try to push apart, but if you have a plus and a minus, they will try to stick together. In, on the large scale, it turns out that electric charges mostly tend to balance out. It turns out electric force is extremely strong, but it tends to cancel itself, which is why gravity wins on the everyday scale, where we see an object will fall if you drop it because of the force of gravity, but you won't see dramatic things happen electrically unless you set things up that way. On the other hand, electricity is so strong, it isn't hard to do that. A quarter. I, I calculated at one point that it is made out of a quarter million coulombs of positive charge, but also a quarter million coulombs of negative charge. And a coulomb is a lot of charge. We're talking trillions of trillions of electrons and protons. But they're perfectly balanced out. This thing isn't crackling with electricity, even though it's made of enormous numbers of charges. They cancel each other out. A tiny discrepancy is enough to make dramatic effects. A microcoulomb in this thing will make effects that you can notice. One microcoulomb difference compared to 200,000 coulombs. Whenever we're talking about charged objects, etc., everything's made out of charges. We're talking about these tiny discrepancies, which are actually extremely important. That's where all the phenomena is. Electric force is so strong that even tiny bits of it cause big effects. Now, how do we measure this? What's going on? It turns out that electricity, in some ways, is very, very similar to gravity. You know, universal gravity, gravitational force, is the gravitational constant times mass 1 times mass 2 over r squared. What that means is, if you have two masses, say a kilogram and a kilogram, and you hold them one meter apart, they will attract each other with a force equal to the number value of g, that many newtons of force of attraction. If you double one of the masses, you will double the force. Likewise, the other one. If you double the distance between them, the force will drop to one-fourth of what it was, because it's 1 over r squared. Greater distance, weaker force, and it goes with the square of the distance. So if you go 10 times farther away, it's 1 one-hundredth the force. So that's how gravitational force works in the universe. Everything in the universe, this marker and this marker, they attract each other. Except we don't notice this on the everyday scale because big G happens to be 6.67 times 10 to the 
negative 11th power newtons times meter squared per kilogram squared. So if you have one kilogram and one kilogram one meter apart, you only get 67 trillionths of a newton, which is why you don't notice it on everyday scale. You have to amass something the size of a planet before you get noticeable amounts of gravity. But electric force is much, much stronger, so it's easy to get dramatic electric effects inside a laboratory. Electric force is an inverse square law. So if the charges get twice as far apart, the force is four times weaker. It's proportional to the size of the first charge and to the size of the second one. The constant of proportionality looks a little weird. Uh, instead of saying a K, as some books do, uh, we say one over four pi epsilon naught, or epsilon zero, uh, which has a historical name, the permittivity of free space, historical reasons. At any rate, that constant epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, measured in coulomb squared per newton meter squared, which is just sort of the junk units required to make this formula come out to newtons. How much force is that? 9 billion newtons of force between 1 coulomb and 1 coulomb 1 meter apart. So way stronger than 67 trillionths of a newton. It only requires a tiny amount of electric charge, relatively speaking, to have an effect that overwhelms gravity. That's why you can have things stick together. You can rub a balloon on your head and stick it to the wall. Uh, just that tiny bit of electrons being scraped off of your hair onto the balloon uh, can cause enough of an effect to stick the balloon on and overcome gravity. Given these basics, uh, how do materials act? Some materials will not let charge flow through them. They're insulators. Others let it flow through with difficulty. We call them semiconductors. Uh, silicon, germanium, that's why we build computer chips out of them. We want them to conduct sometimes and not other times, one and zero. Uh, conductors, metals, just about all metals are good conductors. Uh, so is salt water, and as a consequence, so are we. We're good conductors of electricity. Uh, this is good things and bad things. We can get electrocuted, but our own brains are electrical, so we do need to be able to conduct electricity in order to function. Now, while some classes might save this for the very end of the lecture, it seems to me that this is the best place to start. Because in Physics 1, you learned about forces and energy. They're familiar, so we could talk about electrical phenomena by starting out talking about the force, which is the fundamental. It's kind of how Newton would do it. We can also talk about electrical energy. Once we have talked about both of those, we can bring in the two new concepts the scalar and vector fields, the electric potential, and the electric potential gradient, aka the electric field. Let's talk about distinguishing four important concepts. Force, energy, potential, and field. Now, these all apply to gravity, and they all apply to electric phenomena, so it makes a great source of comparison. Now, first, force. You know what force is? It's in newtons. Objects uh, attract each other by gravity. And the formula for that force of gravity is big G m1 m2 over r squared. Or here on Earth, you're used to perhaps seeing it as weight equals mg. Those are related. If one of these two objects, one of these two masses is the Earth and the other one is you, then the amount of force is going to equal your weight. This is just the general rule that covers any two masses in the universe. What about energy? Now, whenever you have a conservative force, and gravity is conservative, you have a form of potential energy, a formula for that. Now, you're familiar with potential energy being mgh here on Earth. It turns out in space that uh, the potential energy of universal gravity turns out to be minus g m1 m2 over r. These are two versions that you're used to seeing. So these are for any objects in space. These are here on Earth. So far, so good. That's force and that's energy. What is this new thing, potential? Uh, in terms of gravity, it turns out potential, it's a terrible name because it sounds like potential energy, but it's not potential energy. It's potential energy per mass. So gravitational potential is actually u divided by mass, or you know, mass two, if mass one is the thing actually making it. Gravitational potential would be minus g 
M1, and M1 might be Earth, and R might be the radius of the Earth. So this is a formula for the energy per mass, uh, and over here, U over M would be G times H. So let's try and get comfortable with the idea of potential. What is it? It turns out potential and field are not describing an object. They're describing a location. It's a property of a location in space. So let's take the simplest version here. Suppose you have a shelf, and you're here on Earth, and that shelf is two meters up above the floor. And you're saying that this is height zero, because remember, we get to set zero height wherever, we just have to measure relative changes. All right, so if I have this shelf, I can describe that shelf as having a gravitational potential. What if I put one kilogram of mass on it? If I put one kilogram here, then the potential energy, mgh, is going to be one kilogram times 9.8 meter per second squared here on Earth times two meters. So that's going to be 19.6 joules. So one kilogram has an energy of 19.6 joules relative to the floor. What if I put 10 kilograms up there? Well, if I multiply by 10 kilograms instead of one kilogram, I'm going to get 196 joules is the potential energy of that 10 kilogram mass. But if I ask, what is the energy per mass? It's gonna be the same for both. It's in fact going to be 19.6 joules per kilogram. So we could describe that shelf as having a potential of 19.6 joules for every kilogram you put on there. So it's not energy, it's energy per mass. That's the idea of gravitational potential. Now we didn't get into that much in first semester physics because, well, we didn't really need it. But it turns out it's not just needed in electricity, it's indispensable. Uh, it corresponds to the concept of voltage, which we use all the time in electricity, which is why we're trying to understand the gravitational version here. So one of the ways of thinking about potential is that it is a number at every point in space. And that's what we call a scalar field. Now, in most physics classes and in most physics books, they won't be talking about fields that way. When they say the word field, they mean the gravitational field, uh, a vector field, which I'm getting to in a minute. But your class might well be talking about scalar fields. And so they might talk about the gravitational potential as being a scalar field, which is eventually a function of location. You put in a location, you get out some number of joules per kilogram, in the case of gravitational potential. From this scalar field, you can get a vector field by talking about uh, what's the slope? Like, what's the rate of change? Now, if it was all in one line, the slope, simple enough idea, and we've done that where we said, okay, force, for example, is negative rate of change of potential energy with position. But what's a slope in three dimensions? Uh, in 3D, it's called a gradient. So if you have a value everywhere, say the temperature at every spot in this room, you could stand at one spot and say, which way is warmer? Like if I move in different directions, I might get colder, or warmer, or whatever. Which way would I get the warmest, the soonest? And how far would I have to go to warm up one degree, say? That's what the gradient is. It would say warmer is that way and you'll rise one degree in every centimeter or something like that. So that would be a temperature gradient. You've got a temperature value everywhere, which is a scalar field, uh, but the temperature gradient would be a vector at every location. Here, which way is warmer? Here, which way is warmer? Here, which way is warmer? Um, and it has a magnitude by how quickly you're gonna get warmer as you move and a direction saying which way is warmer. Uh, you can have gradients in other scalar functions. For example, concentration of a solution or concentration of the smell of an apple pie in the air. You might be sniffing and say, oh, I can smell apple pie and I can smell how strong the smell is, but uh, where, where do I go to get that apple pie? 
which way is the concentration rising? And how close am I getting? That how high is that concentration getting? And how quickly is it changing? Because it's going to change rapidly when I'm close. So you can talk about a temperature gradient, a concentration gradient. You can talk about a density gradient, because the density of air changes as you go up through the atmosphere. So all of these are vector fields that you could get from a scalar field. And if gravitational potential is a scalar field, then it turns out that the gravitational field, or what they call the negative of the gravitational potential gradient, everybody else calls it gravitational field, is the negative gradient of, oh, we need a symbol for this. Uh, the typical symbol for potential is phi, for gravitational potential. They might put phi sub g on it to indicate its gravity potential. So the minus the gradient of phi sub g is essentially saying, how quickly will this energy per mass change as I move? So if you move along the shelf, you're not going to get any change. Uh, if you move up and down to a higher shelf or a lower shelf, that's where you're going to get a change. And so the gradient of this thing actually points upward. If you go upward, you get more gravitational potential. So the negative gradient points down. Well, that sounds familiar. It turns out that the negative gradient of gravitational potential is the acceleration due to gravity. It's the acceleration. And that is a gravitational field. One of the reasons we didn't talk about field in first semester is because you already had a name for gravitational field. It's acceleration. So a uh, gravitational field is a vector at every point, right? Here, it's 9.8 meters per second squared downward. And here, and here, and everywhere. It's 9.8 meters per second squared downward in this room. If you go out into space, you would have different values that are all pointed at the Earth. So you can have a vector field describing gravity, and it gives the acceleration at every location. That's what we typically mean by a gravitational field. And so it usually has the symbol vector g. Gravitational field is in meters per second squared, it turns out, because a gradient is effectively the potential per meter. So if you have energy per mass per meter, it turns out you end up with meters per second squared. The negative gradient of the potential is the gravitational field. That's what's going on with gravity. What's going on with electric force, electric energy, electric potential, and electric field? Electric force. The formula for that is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 over r squared. Analogous to the gravitational potential energy, we have the electric potential energy, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, Q1, Q2 over R. This one does not have a minus sign because like charges repel and would have a positive potential energy. I mean, you have to do work to bring them together. It's like loading a spring. You have two positives and you're pushing them together. The closer they are together, the more positive energy they have. You release them, they'll have kinetic energy as they fly apart. On the other hand, if two things are bound to each other, a positive and a negative that attract each other, then you would expect the energy to be negative. Things in a bound state have negative energy. An object, the moon in orbit around the Earth, has negative total gravitational potential energy. Because we count zero as being free and separate, and you would need to add energy to the moon to get it free. Therefore, it's less than zero. It's essentially a way of describing where zero is. Just like in good old MGH, we chose whatever zero height we wanted, turns out when we're dealing with these point charge formulas, uh, we generally want things infinitely far apart, having nothing to do with each other, as being zero. And the formulas pretty much have that preset. So force, energy, familiar concepts. And we know that you can find force is the negative rate of change of the potential energy, because that's true in general for any kind of force and its potential energy. Now, in three dimensions, we would call that the force vector is negative gradient of the potential, which gradient just means slope in 3D.
it just says which way is towards lower potential energy, and that's which way the gravitational force would be. In the case of electric, we're saying which way would the force be on this charged particle in order for it to have a lower total energy. Because if it's going to gain kinetic, it has to lose potential energy. All right, so now, potential. Gravitational potential was a new concept. It was describing a location by giving the energy per mass. Electric potential is giving the energy per charge at a location. So again, electric potential and electric field are going to be properties of a location. So electric potential, you'll see it called V, a curly E, or phi, most often phi early on. But what we measure potential in is voltage, because a volt is a joule per coulomb. I tend to call potential voltage whenever possible, but I'm trying to clarify your lecture here for you, and they will talk about it being electric potential, electric potential. So despite hating the name, I'll go with it. But really, it's voltage. So we've got electric potential, which is the energy per charge. So the energy per charge near a single point charge would be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. So this would be Q2 and this would be Q1. So Q1 is creating the voltage. Q2 would be whatever feels it. So you have these basic relations that voltage is energy over charge, which means the charge times any change in voltage would be the change in potential energy. That's the essential idea of potential. Now, what we care about is not a constant potential. That's pretty boring. We care when the potential is different in different places. Like the job of an electric battery is to have one end of it be 9 volts higher than the other end. And so you can set up a gradient by saying, how far do I have to travel to get through those, say, 9 volts? Field, now, your class will refer to potential as being a scalar field. True. Uh, it is a scalar field. It is a number at every point. Uh, but if your textbook or any regular book or the MCAT is talking about an electric field, they do not mean this thing. They mean this thing. Electric field, capital E vector, we'll get introduced to it properly around lecture four or so, but they'll be talking about it the whole time. They'll just talk about electric potential gradient, electric potential gradient. Electric field is really negative gradient of the voltage, the negative gradient of the electric potential. Essentially, it's saying, well, volts per meter. How many volts is it going to change if I travel a meter? Now, if you have 9 volts to cover and you do it in 1 centimeter, then that's going to be 900 volts per meter. But if you have 9 volts to cover and you take an entire meter to do it, that's going to be only 9 volts per meter. Right? The change in voltage divided by the change in distance is giving you the magnitude of your electric field, your potential gradient. And that's what's actually going to make things happen. Because just as energy per charge is voltage, it turns out that electric field is really force per charge. Force over charge is electric field. And so you can find the force if you know the charge and you know the electric field at the location of the charge. Also, since electric field is that, you could say the electric force on a charge would be negative Q times the potential gradient. Let's talk about the units for a minute. Potential, a volt, is a joule per coulomb, and that's the unit of electric potential. So electric field is that per meter. There are two ways to describe that. You could say Newton per coulomb, uh, as I said there, and it doesn't have a special name. We just call it Newtons per coulomb. But we can also, because we're talking about uh, voltage here, we could also talk about it being volt per meter those work out to be the same because a volt is a joule per coulomb and a joule per meter is a newton. So those are two ways of saying the same thing. Generally, electric field is introduced as being the force per charge, uh, and it's a property of a location. But you can equivalently think of it as the negative gradient of the electric potential. 
So if you're focusing on voltage, on potential as being the crucial importance, then electric field, they will just be referring to that as negative electric potential gradient. Those are the concepts of force in newtons, energy in joules, potential, electric potential in volts, an electric field in either newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. And those are important ideas to keep straight. All right, let's see an example. Suppose I have a positively charged object. Like every object is made out of lots of positive and lots of negative, millions upon millions of coulombs of plus and minus. But the excess positive, meaning some electrons were scraped off, might be, say, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Remember, coulomb is a lot. We're going to talk about microcoulombs or nanocoulombs or even picocoulombs a lot of the time. So two microcoulombs of positive charge here. And let's say that we have three microcoulombs over here. These are going to repel each other with how much force. Depends how far apart they are. Let's say that they are 10 centimeters apart. Let's calculate the force between them. So the electric force here is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 over r squared. So that is 1 over 4 pi 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 coulomb, 3 times 10 to the minus 6 coulomb, 0.1 meter squared. When we work all that out, we find that the total force between these two objects is 5.4 newtons. That's a tiny amount of charge on each, and they were 10 centimeters apart, and we've got 5 newtons. It's easy to get sizable forces and phenomena from a small amount of charge relative to the amount of charge inside an object. So that's an example of electric force. If I move these to a meter apart, so that they were 10 times farther apart, the force would be 100 times weaker, because it goes with r squared. So they'd be only 0.05 newtons if they were a meter apart as opposed to 10 centimeters. So distance matters a lot. All right, so that's electric force. Um, how much energy is there in this arrangement? Like, how much work did I have to do to grab these two charges that were really far apart and drag them together until they were only 10 centimeters apart? The electric potential energy stored in that pair of charges is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 over r. And it turns out that since that's just an r squared, you would end up with dividing by 0.1 one less time, so it would be 0 0.54 joules worth of energy. So half a joule of energy for bringing those two charges together. And they're repelling each other with a force of 5.4 newtons. All right, so far so good. That's what we're talking about happening here. Now, what if I took this charge away though? If I just left this empty space or you know, ignored it and considered some other point that was 10 centimeters away, some point P, if there was nothing there, what would this charge be doing to that location? Remember, the energy per charge is the voltage, is the electric potential, and it has a value there. So the electric potential phi at point P would be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r is the energy per charge. It turns out that that electric potential is 180,000 volts. That's what this charge does to the region 10 centimeters away from it. And it drops off as 1 over r. So if you go twice as far away, you've got half that many volts. If you go 10 times as far, it's one-tenth that many volts. So there's a sizable voltage here, uh, just being near any one charge. But that's not an energy until you actually put some charge there. The amount of charge you put there will determine how much energy you have. Because the potential times the charge gives you the energy. Likewise, we could also talk about the electric field 
at that location, the potential gradient. The electric field at point P caused by this charge is actually 1.8 times 10 to the sixth newtons per coulomb, or volts per meter. That's how quickly the potential is changing as you move in that direction. And that is the direction that points towards lower potential. See, if you get close to the positive charge, you're at a high voltage, high potential. Uh, if you get close to a negative charge, you'll be at a low voltage, a low potential. So electric field always points away from positive charges and towards negative charges. The gradient would point uphill, so to speak, towards the positive. The negative gradient is the electric field and points away. Now, if that's the electric potential at point P, an electric field at point P, due to the presence of that charge alone, well, what about this charge? That's also going to have an effect with point P. Or taking another point out here, point S, we could ask, what's the total effect of this charge and this charge on this location? Do they just add? Good news, yes, they do. That's called linear superposition. If you have a voltage from this and a voltage from that at this location, you just add them up to get the total voltage. Uh, if you want to know the total electric field here, you find the electric field due to this and the electric field due to that, and you add them up. Now that's actually vector addition. I've got things all on a line here so they point the same way and our math is simple. So what would we get? At point S, charge one, Q1 here, uh, is making a potential. And charge two, right here, is making another potential. And we can just add them up. So I factored out the one over four pi epsilon naught because I didn't want to write it twice. And we have two microcoulombs over 0.2 meters, which is the distance that S is from here, plus 3 microcoulomb times 0.1 meter, which is the distance that charge is from point S. And when we calculate this, we find 3.6 times 10 to the fifth volts is the voltage at this simply due to adding up the other two. Likewise, we could simply take the electric field due to this, which is pointing to the right, and the electric field due to this at point S, which is also pointing to the right. And because they're pointing the same direction, we can just add up their magnitudes. And it would be exactly the same calculation, except this would be squared and this would be squared. So that's how you add up the effects of multiple point charges. Speaking in general, why are we bringing in these ideas of electric potential, electric field? We're sort of taking a problem and breaking it into two pieces. Instead of saying, this charge is exerting this force on this charge and has this much energy. We're saying this charge did something to the space. And then stage two, we put a charge number two there and found out what happened to it. And this way of breaking up the problem actually is very helpful because if you're doing gravity, then effectively this is all you need to do because you've got a planet or a star, you have a simple round object, you've got a limited supply of them. You can't make like a horseshoe shape of mass that has a significant amount of gravity. You don't have to worry about any cubical planets. Uh, and you need something the size of a planet before you'd notice the gravity. But electric force is different because it's so easy to make large effects. We can charge up a wire that's semicircular or coiled in a spiral or uh, we can make a rectangle of sheet of metal and charge it up. We can make arbitrarily complicated sources of electric field and potential. So it's actually very useful to be able to split the problem into two parts. Like first, our complicated set of sources creates a voltage and electric field here. And then second, you put a charge there and see what happens to it. So all of that complicated phenomena, lots and lots of calculus, etc can be summarized by a couple of numbers saying, this is the voltage right here, and this is the electric field right here, the potential gradient. At that location, then you can take different amounts of charge and put there and see what would happen to them. So it's an important separation. And in fact, it's more than just a calculational aid. It turns out that electric fields are very real. Uh, you'll find out later that light is partially made of electric fields.
So uh, electric fields can carry energy and momentum and angular momentum. They um, have a definite reality. They can exist arbitrarily far away from the charges that originally created them. So they kind of have a separate independent reality. They're important concept, as important as the idea of a particle of mass. So that's another reason to get used to the idea of an electric field. Finally, let's talk about how to draw these. I mean, if you have a positive charge, you want to be able to visualize, without doing a ton of calculations, roughly what's going on here. Let's say that this location here is at 10 volts around this point charge. By point charge, I just mean some tiny little charge that's round. What's going to happen if we get cut the distance in half, do half the radius of that sphere? It's going to be 20 volts. And if we cut that in half, we're going to be at 40 volts. And this thing which I originally drew as the surface would be 80 volts. And as we cut in half, we double, cut in half, we double. In order to get down to 5 volts, we would have to double that, so this would be the 5 volt line. And if we double that, this would be 2.5 volts. And these lines that I'm drawing, which are really representing surfaces, these are spheres, are what we call equipotential surfaces, equal voltage. So those are all the spots at the same voltage. If you have a single point charge, simple enough. What happens if you have more than one? Well, if you have two positive charges, then visualizing it, it's sort of like every positive is like a mountain. And really, it sort of spikes upward uh, at the location, because if r goes to 0, you're divided by 0. In theory, that would be infinite potential. Of course, we never actually get there. But you can think of these as two really tall mountains. So you would get very close in. The relevant things would just be the closest charge. But once you start getting farther out, you might get into something like that. And when you start getting really far out, like if you get far enough away from this, you can't tell if it's way off in the distance. You can't tell if it's one charge or two. So eventually, it's going to start looking round. So that's roughly speaking what the equipotentials would look like for a pair of like charges. All right, but what if they're not alike? What if one's positive, one's negative? If I had an, one negative charge, essentially the numbers would look just like this with minus signs. But if I have a positive charge here, a negative charge here, halfway between them, the, you would get a positive voltage and a negative voltage. If these are equal size, then these would just cancel, and that would be a zero volt line, plane, actually. And then close in here, and close in here, you'd have things that were close to being circles but they would start to get more distorted as you got further out. And so this is roughly what it would look like. And this would be a hilltop, and this would be a valley, actually, becoming a pit as you get really close in. So this might be 0 volts, and this might be 5 volts, and 10 volts, and 20 volts. And this might be negative 5 volts, and negative 10 volts, and negative 20 volts. So if you have a positive and a negative, somewhere in between them, there has to be a point at 0 volts, uh, which means you can have a line that's essentially going off to infinity somewhere. If the charges are unequal, you have other things going on. Now, one of the things I'm also used to doing is drawing electric fields, but you don't seem to be getting into that for a while, so we can leave it at that. So this is your early impressions of what pictures are. If you have a chunk of metal, by the way, a chunk of metal is going to be an equipotential. You know, if all the charges are stationary. If you put some charge on a piece of metal, it's all going to be at one voltage. So if you had a cube, or let's say a rectangular brick that was charged up, the uh, equipotentials might look like this. And then gradually get rounder as you move out. Because if you go really far away, you can't tell it's shaped like a brick. You can't tell what it's shaped like. It's just a distant speck. And so you would get something like that. And there's your introduction to electric potential, electric field, potential gradient, uh, electric charge, force, energy.
linear superposition, and how to draw equipotentials.